Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered today on the 30th of the 11th month on our Creator's calendar as we comprehend it, which happens to coincide with February 10th, 2024. And we're taking a little segue from what we've been reading to cover a section of what is called the Recognitions of Clement that has to deal with a topic I think is very important. The kingdom right? The Malkuth of Yahuwah and his righteousness. But essentially, as believers, we all want to learn the truth. We all want to be partakers of what is real, of substance and, and, and lasting. And to do that, we have to do it in certain ways. I think this is an excellent example where Kepha tells us exactly what's required to be able to learn the truth. And you get to see a contrast of someone who's acting satanic or adversarial if you will and doing the things that are instigated by demons or satan's ruach what the dead sea scrolls calls the spirit or the ruach of malkirasha as opposed to the ruach of malkizedek right but right here this is the recognitions of clement also known as the nazarene acts of the apostles by jackson snyder this is book one, chapter 20, the Malkuth of Yahuwah, which is the kingdom of Yahuwah and his righteousness. This is Kepha speaking. So shalom be to you all who are prepared to give your right hands to the truth or to truth. For whosoever are obedient to him seem indeed themselves to confer some favor upon Yahuwah whereas they do themselves obtain from him the gift of his greatest bounty, walking in his paths of righteousness. So the first duty of all is to inquire into the righteousness of Yahuwah and his kingdom, his righteousness, that we may be taught to act rightly, his kingdom, that we may know what is the reward appointed, for labor and patience, enduring to the end, in love, right? In which Malkuth, or kingdom, there is indeed a bestowal of ageless tov things upon the tov, but upon those who have acted contrary to the will of Yahuwah, a worthy infliction of penalties in proportion to the doings of every one. He recompenses each according to their works. And that's why I mentioned there's levels of reward. Shaul puts it in this way that each star manifests its own light uniquely and each has its own portion. So is the reward of everyone that's of the children of light. And correspondingly, for the wickedness of the evil ones, they're each going to get what they deserve according to the measure of the wickedness that is in them because he's not impartial or unrighteous in anything. This is, it becomes you, therefore, while you are here, that is, while you are in the present life, to ascertain the will of Yahuwah, while there is opportunity also of doing it. For if any one, before he amends his doings, desires to investigate concerning things that he cannot discover, very important. And I'll give you one example. Anyone who's sincere, and I mean honest, if you're sincere about looking into the name of your creator, and in particular, our Mashiach, you're going to find that there are at least four different spellings of his name. In the Masoretic text, you have two that are known in the original covenant writings, and then another that was added after the Babylonian captivity of Yeshua, for example. But those spellings, um, and that's with vowel points. The two spellings are really identical, Yahushua, but people that don't have regard to the vowel points of the Masoretic text might not consider the wa that was removed from the defective spelling. So that's a legitimate, we'll say, five-letter and six-letter spelling, both are literally in the Masoretic text. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, you can find Yahshua, yod Hey shin wa Ayin, one time at least. You can find Yahushua, the six-letter spelling, dozens of times, 
or I'm sorry, I can't say that for certainty. You can see it at least five times I've looked at myself, possibly more. And then you have the variant spelling of Yahusha once that was um, edited and corrected, but it did say Yahusha at one point. And the fact remains that you have different spellings for his name, all literally written. And it's not something that you can discover if you're honest and you don't know the language on your own. When you get to that point, like I did, and I acknowledged my poverty, I literally prayed, and he literally answered my prayer to tell me his truth, the, the, the truth of his name. And I encourage everyone to investigate first, realize that, I mean, if you can know the defective and full spellings, it can come to your mind that his the full letter spelling is his name. That is great. If this is something that you need to know and you have to search out, you're going to come to the same conclusion I did. You can't know for certain without making your own choice. And then you might do the same thing I did, which was pray and ask him, if such and such is your name, let such and such a thing happen to prove it. And then it either will or it won't, right? And then just like Yahoo Nathan, you pray and believe he will answer you. In the sincerity of your heart, you ask for these things, he will give it to you. I've had that on more than one occasion. My wife's had answered prayer. Others in this group have as well. So it's not something that I'm, it's not novel. It's literally just trusting what his word says and doing it. Nothing of ourselves, but just trusting in what is written. But back on point here. When I couldn't discover it, I, I prayed and he gave me the answer. That's what I encourage everyone to do. To study and then ask him when you can't know for yourself. But right here, it says, for if anyone, before he amends his doings, and this is the important part, it says, the one who does gains comprehension. It's impossible for us to comprehend things until we repent of what we do that is offensive to him. And that's in our character, how we treat others. But that's, that's for later on here. It says, if anyone, before he amends his doings, desires to investigate concerning things that he cannot discover, such investigation will be foolish and ineffectual, for the time is short, and the judgment of Yahuwah will be occupied with deeds, not questions. Therefore, before all things, let us inquire into this, what or in what manner must we act that we may merit to obtain ageless life? For if we occupy the short time of this life with vain and useless questions, we will without doubt go into the presence of Yahuwah empty and void of good works, when, as I have said, our works will be brought into judgment. For everything has its own time and place. This is the place, this the time of works, the world to come, that of recompenses. That we may not therefore be entangled by changing the order of places and times, let us inquire in the first place what is the righteousness of Yahuwah. So that, like persons going to be set or going to set out on a journey, we may be filled with Tov works as with abundant provision, so that we may be able to come to the Malkuth of Yahuwah as to a very great city. For to those who think aright, Yahuwah is manifest even by the operations of the world that he has made, using the evidence of his creation. And therefore, since there ought to be no doubt about Yahuwah, which for anyone that doesn't know, his name is yod Hey wah Hey, It literally means he who or he, he who or he who does, right? And then hey wah Hey is to cause to be, to fall about, what happens to exist. So he who causes it to be is literally the meaning of his name. It is also he who is and who was and who is coming, right? It's inherent in the name of Yahuwah there. It's the identity of the one who causes all things that are. He says, we now, or we have now to inquire only about his righteousness and his kingdom, or Malkuth. 
But if our mind suggests to us to make any inquiry concerning secret and hidden things, before we inquire into the works of righteousness, this is important. The Dead Sea Scrolls were certainly hidden. These things were certainly hidden, right? The, the, the ones that were not made known just to everybody is what's outside of the Bible, what's called apocryphal, okay? And I use the word Bible because everyone has an idea of what that means. It's a definite thing. That word itself, while Biblios is, again, related to the false pagan mighty one, that is that city, uh, Geber, in Hebrew, Biblios in Greek. It's where the paper was made for writing, which is where the Greek word for Bibliaridian, or what they translate as the little book that was in the hand of that messenger in Revelation. But that was foretelling the Wycliffe translation, and that's where that word Bible actually comes from, right there from Revelation in fulfillment of his foretelling of the translation of the Bible in before the Reformation. All of that was mentioned, and again, everyone interested in those, I highly recommend the Antichrist for Dummies series. You test it for yourself. Don't blindly believe everything and prove it, and you'll be as convinced as I am about the historicist interpretation of Scripture and the literal fulfillment of these things first in the stars and corresponding with the events on earth, just like he wrote or just like he foretold. But here we go. It says, before we inquire into things that are hidden, or sorry, but if our mind suggests to us to make any inquiry concerning secret and hidden things before we inquire into the works of righteousness, we ought to render to ourselves a reason. Because if acting well, we will merit to obtain deliverance, then going to Yahuwah chaste and clean, we will be filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and will know all things that are secret and hidden without any cavailing of questions. Whereas now, even if anyone should spend the whole of his life in inquiring into these things, he not only will not be able to find them, but will involve himself in greater errors, because he did not first enter through the way of righteousness and strive to reach the haven of life. And therefore I advise that his righteousness be first inquired into, that pursuing our journey through it and placed in the way of truth, we may be able to find Yahushua, running not with swiftness of foot, but with tovim or pleasantness of works. And tovim, tov, they translate it as good. It means tov, pleasant. All right. It is like a well-pleasing aroma in his nostrils is what it's called. Literally the meaning of tov. And that enjoying his guidance, he may, or we, may be in no danger of mistaking the way. For if under his guidance we will merit to enter that city to which we desire to come, all things concerning which we now inquire, we will see with our eyes, being made, as it were, heirs of all things. Comprehend, therefore, that the way is this course of our life, the travelers are those who do tov works. The gate, or the door, is Yahushua, of whom we speak. The city is the Malkuth in which dwells the Almighty Father, to whom, or Hashadai Ab, right? It would be Ab Hashadai in Hebrew, probably. Whom only those can see who are of pure heart. And it's in the Ruach. No man in the flesh can see him and live, right? Let us not then think the labor of this journey hard, because at the end of it there will be rest. For Yahushua himself also from the beginning of the world through the course of time hastens to rest, which means he's laboring with the Father until then, doing his works of creation, like the parable that he gave in the creation account. Literally what he did, but a parable of what he's doing through time. 
the truth in every context. And this is where it's mentioned in the Psalms and it talks about things where he speaks in parables from the beginning, from the foundations of the world. And then you can see when he was with them, it says there's nothing that he didn't say in parables and to his taught ones that came to him and inquired what they meant. He revealed the truth just as we come to him first removing the things offensive and then inquiring of him the truth and he makes it known to us. There is no difference. For he is present with us at all times, and if at any time it is necessary, he appears and corrects us. Yahushua does, okay? That he may bring to ageless life those who obey him. Everyone who does not obey the Son still is under the wrath of Elohim. So this is not inconsistent with the things we can read plainly in Scripture. And that's the key. Everything in these books line up like a hand in a glove with the rest of what's written, but it explains it coherently. And that's what I love about them. It says, Therefore, this is my judgment, as also it is the pleasure of Yahushua, that inquiry should first be made concerning righteousness by those especially who profess that they know Yahuwah. If therefore any one has anything to propose that he thinks better, let him speak. And when he has spoken, let him hear. But with patience and quietness, for in order to this at the first by way of salutation, I prayed for shalom to you all. And that's the key to learning. And then we get to see what happens when we don't do so. Okay. To this, Shimon answered, we have no need of your shalom. For if there be shalom and concord, we will not be able to make any advance towards the discovery of truth. For robbers and debauchees have shalom among themselves, and every immorality agrees with itself. And if we have met with this view, that for the sake of shalom we should give assent to all that is said, we will confer no benefit upon the hearers. But on the contrary, we will impose upon them and will depart friends. Chavarim is friends in Hebrew. So do not invoke shalom, but rather battle, which is the mother of shalom. And if you can, exterminate errors. And do not seek for friendship obtained by unfair admissions. For this I would have you know, above all, that when two fight with each other, then there will be shalom when one has been defeated and has fallen. And therefore fight as best ye can, and do not expect shalom without war, which is impossible. Or if it can be obtained, show us how. To this Kepha answered, Hear with all attention, men, what we say. Let us suppose that this world is a great plain, and that from two states whose Melachim or kings are at variance with each other, two generals were sent to fight. And suppose the general of the Tov Melech gave, or king, gave this counsel, that both armies should, without bloodshed, submit to the authority of the better Melech, whereby all should be safe without danger. But that the opposite general should say, No, but we must fight, that not he who is worthy, but he who is stronger may reign with those who will escape. Which I ask you, would you rather choose? I doubt not, but that you would give your hands to the better king, with the safety of all. And I do not now desire, as Shimon says that I do, that assent should be given for the sake of shalom to those things that are spoken amiss, but that the truth be sought for with quietness and order. For some, in the contest of disputations, when they perceive that their error is confuted, immediately begin for the sake of making good or tow of their retreat, to create a disturbance and to stir up strifes, that it may not be manifest to all that they are defeated. And therefore I frequently entreat that the investigation of the matter in dispute may be conducted with all patience and quietness, 
so that if perchance anything seem to be not rightly spoken, it may be allowed to go back over it and explain it more distinctly. For sometimes a thing may be spoken in one way and heard in another, while it is either advanced too obscurely or not attended to with sufficient care. And on this account I desire that our conversation should be conducted patiently, so that neither should come, or neither should the one snatch it away from the other, nor should the unseasonable speech of one contradicting interrupt the speech of the other, and that we should not cherish the desire of finding fault, but that we should be allowed, as I have said, to go over again what has not been clearly enough spoken, that by fairest examination the knowledge of the truth may become clearer. So it's not about drowning out another voice, but that whoever is trying to convey their message can do so in an effective manner. And then they can hear an, a, a response in like manner, in quietness and in patience, so that the truth can be known. This is how it's obtained amongst believers, and this is contrary to how Simon is acting, just for contrast. And Simon is the one that's indwelt with demons, or Satan, if you will. It says, For we ought to know that if anyone is conquered by the truth, it is not he that is conquered, but the ignorance, the mother of all evils, as it's mentioned, that is in him, which is the worst of all demons, so that he who can drive it out receives a palm of deliverance, and ignorance is not, not knowing what we are able to know, but we choose not to. Okay? For it is our purpose to benefit the hearers, not that we may conquer badly, but that we may be well conquered for the acknowledgement of the truth. For if our speech is acu acuate, er, acuated, sorry, acuted by the desire of seeking the truth, even although we will speak anything imperfectly through man's frailty, Yahuwah in his unspeakable tovim will fill up secretly in the comprehensions of the hearers those things that are lacking. For he is righteous. And according to the purpose of every one, he enables some to find easily what they seek. And while to others he renders obscure even what is before their eyes. And if you really want to know why, I'll give you that you can search this out for yourselves and prove it or prove me wrong. But a, he who has a good eye is Baruch. And he who has an evil eye is going to get what he has coming and great is the darkness in him. Right? He explains these things. It's whether you're beneficial, generous to others, or stingy in the things that you have that can benefit them. Pretty simple. <clears throat> and he requits everyone according to what they deserve. Since then, the way of Yahuwah is the way of Shalom. Let us with Shalom seek the things that are Yahuwah's. If anyone has anything to advance in answer to this, let him do so. But if there is no one who desires to answer, I will begin to speak. And I myself will bring forward what another may object to me and will refute it. Now, the answer goes on a little bit longer. Well, I'm, I'd like to cover that. But if you have any questions, feel free. I'm going to try not to interrupt too much anymore, though. <clears throat> It says, when therefore Kepha had begun to continue his discourse, because no one objected or said anything, Shimon interrupting his speech said, why do you hasten to speak whatever you please? I understand your tricks. You wish to bring forward those matters whose explanation you have well studied, that you may appear to the ignorant crowd to be speaking well. But I will not allow you this subterfuge. Now, therefore, since you promise as a brave man to answer to all that anyone chooses to bring forward, be pleased to answer me in the first place. Then Kepha said, 
I am ready, only provided that our discussion may be with Shalom. Then Shimon said, Do you not see, simpleton, that in pleading for Shalom you act in opposition to your master, and that what you propose is not suitable to him who promises that he will overthrow ignorance? Or if you are right in asking Shalom from the audience, then your master was wrong in saying, I have not come to send Shalom on earth, but a sword. For either you say well and he not well, or else if your master said well, then you not at all well. For you do not understand that your statement is contrary to his, who's taught one you profess yourself to be. Then Kepha, Neither he who sent me did amiss in sending a sword upon the earth nor do I act contrary to him in asking shalom of the hearers. But you both, unskillfully and rashly, find fault with what you do not comprehend. Something that ignorance presupposes in you. If you, uh, last one, the two Ruach Oath in the exhortation from the Damascus document, it lists these things as well. The two spirits from the Apostolic Constitutions, the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs, the Shepherd of Hermas, literally all over the place, the Epistle of Barnabas, it covers these things in great detail. I highly recommend everyone to look into those. It gives us the key to identify Satan's and demon, demonic influences in our own thought process and to abstain from them. Otherwise, we can believe and do things that are contrary to what is in essence, love, okay? He says, You have both unskillfully and rashly find fault with what you do not comprehend. For you have heard that the Master came not to send shalom on earth, but that he also said, Baruch are the shalom makers, for they will be called the very sons of Yahuwah. You have not heard. So my sentiments are not different from those of the Master when he recommended shalom, to the keepers of which he assigned baraka, or blessings, if you will. Then Shimon said, In your desire to answer for your master, Kepha, you have brought a much more serious charge against him. If he himself came not to make shalom, yet enjoined upon others to keep it, where then is the consistency of that other saying of his? It is enough for the taught one, that he be as his master. See, looking to trip him up instead of comprehend. To this Kepha answered, Our master Yahushua, who is the foreteller of truth, the Navi Emmet, and ever mindful of himself, neither contradicted himself nor enjoined upon us anything different from what he himself practiced. For whereas he said, I am not come to send shalom on earth, but a sword, and henceforth you will see father separated from son, son from father, husband from wife and wife from husband, mother from daughter and daughter from mother, brother from brother, father-in-law from daughter-in-law, friend from friend. All these contain the halakha or walk of shalom, and I will tell you how. At the beginning of his preaching, as desiring to invite and lead all to deliverance and induce them to bear patiently labors and trials, he baruch the poor and promised that they should obtain the kingdom of Shamayim for their endurance in poverty or of poverty, in order that under the influence of such a hope or expectation, they might bear with equanimity the right of poverty despising covetedness, for covetedness is one and the greatest of most pernicious sins. But he promised also that the hungry and the thirsty should be satisfied with the ageless baraka of righteousness in order that they might bear poverty patiently and not be led by it to undertake any unrighteous work. In like manner also, he said that the pure in heart are Baruch, and that thereby they should see Yahuwah, 
in order that everyone desiring so great a tov might keep himself from evil and polluted thoughts. Therefore, or thus therefore, our master, inviting his taught ones to patience, impressed upon them that the Baraka of Shalom was also to be preserved with the labor of patience. Because people will try your patience and it's up to you. You have a choice whether to retaliate, take matters into your own hands, or give it to your maker as all things being by his will that happened to you. But on the other hand, he mourned over those who lived in riches and luxury, who bestowed nothing upon the poor, proving that they must render an account because they did not pity their neighbors, even when they were in poverty, whom they ought to love as themselves. But by, or sorry, and by such sayings as these, he brought some indeed to obey him, but others he rendered hostile. The believers, therefore, and the obedient he charges to have shalom among themselves, and says to them, Prosperous are the shalom makers, ashray in the Hebrew, which means to be confirmed, prosperous, authenticated, walking straight, happy, and blessed. Okay? Prosperous are the, the shalom makers, for they will be called the very sons of Yahuwah. But to those who not only did not believe, but set themselves in opposition to his walk, he proclaims the war of the word and of confutation, and says that henceforth you will see son separated from father, and husband from wife, and daughter from mother, and brother from brother, and daughter-in-law from mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be they of his own house." For in every house, when there begins to be a difference betwixt, that's uh, the Hebrew word betuch. Betuch means in the midst of or between. And in Old English, it was betwixt, and then it became between as time went on. But there's another one of those words for you. But it says, when there begins to be a difference betwixt believer and unbeliever, there is necessarily a contest the unbelievers on the one hand fighting against the belief, or amuna, and the believers on the other, confuting the old error and the vices of sins in them. In like manner, also during the last period of his teaching, he wages the war, or war, against the scribes and Pharisees, charging them with evil deeds and unsound doctrine, and with hiding the key of knowledge that they had handed down to them from Moshe, by which the gate of the Shemaim Malkuth might be opened. But when our master sent forth to preach, or sent us forth to preach, rather, he commanded us that into whatsoever city or house we should enter, we should say Shalom be to this house. And if, said he, a son of Shalom be there. Your Shalom will come upon him. But if there be not, your Shalom will return to you. Also that going out from that house or city, we should shake off upon them the very dust that adhered to our feet. But it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city or house. This indeed he commanded to be done at length, if first the word of truth be preached in the city or house whereby they who receive the belief of the truth may become, may become sons of Shalom and sons of Yahuwah, and those who will not receive it may be convicted as enemies of Shalom and enemies of Yahuwah. Thus, therefore, we, observing the commands of our Master, first offer Shalom to our hearers, that the way of deliverance may be known without any tumult. But if anyone does not receive the words of Shalom, nor acquiesce in the truth, we know how to direct against him the war of the word, and to rebuke him sharply by confuting his ignorance, and charging home upon him his sins. Therefore of necessity we offer Shalom, that if anyone is a son of Shalom, our Shalom may come upon him. 
but from him who makes himself an enemy of shalom. Our shalom will return to ourselves. We do not, therefore, as you say, propose shalom by agreement with the immoral, for indeed we, would, we should straightaway have given you the right hand, meaning shaking his hand, just so you know, but only in order that through our discussing quietly and patiently, it might be more easily ascertained by the hearers which one is the true speech. But if you differ and disagree with yourself, how will you stand? He must of necessity fall, who is divided in himself. For every kingdom divided against itself will not stand. If you have anything to say to this, say on. And he mentions that he tries to trip him up saying, but now he causes division who divides families amongst themselves. So how can he be called good if he causes the division that you just said that those that are divided can't stand, right? But um, that's a different topic for a different time that we don't really have the time to get into. However, all of the major questions of any type of thing that trips you up answered by these discussions. It's amazing stuff in these books. I highly recommend it. Although I recommend it with a cravat and I'll share this before I end it here because these books are not meant for everyone. It's just plain. It wasn't in what we call the Bible. It wasn't given for everyone to know at all times. And there's a reason for that. Fourth Ezra mentioned specifically what books were given to be made open in public and which ones were hidden and why. And that same thing is also reiterated in... Um, a letter that's that's attached as an appendix to this writing. In this one in particular, he has parts of the homilies, which is another another writing like the recognitions, but a little different. And then you have um, a few other things. One of them is an epistle of the martyrdom of Kepha and Clement being made the overseer of Rome, which he was from 63 or so at the martyrdom until 93 when he himself was martyred by his cousin Domitian. And then uh, that's this letter right here. And then you also have a letter that Kepha wrote to um, Yaakov about why not to share his writings. And it's because it's not meant for everyone and you're going to be held to a higher account for what you do with this, with this truth. So Ab willing, we all receive it well and we take it to heart. We're meek and humble and we love him. And it's to our benefit. But until then, y'all who will be with you all, and you have a wonderful Shabbat, Shavuot Tov, and we will see you next time. So thank you.